I can't say making this particular video was a bundle of laughs because Achiba's poem is a profoundly sad one about the impact of war on a mother and her child. So it's about the ravages of war and about motherly love and therefore there's a link with D.H. Lawrence's piano but of course the context is dramatically different because we move from the cosy parlour of Lawrence's poem to the squalid environment of a refugee camp in Achievers. So I'll look at it closely in a second, but uh, first a reading of it, my reading this time. No Madonna and child could touch her tenderness for a son she would soon have to forget. The air was heavy with odours of diarrhoea, of unwashed children with washed out ribs and dried up bottoms waddling in laboured steps behind blown empty bellies. Other mothers there had long ceased to care, but not this one. She held a ghost smile between her teeth and in her eyes the memory of a mother's pride. She had bathed him and rubbed him down with bare palms. She took from their bundle of possessions a broken comb and combed the rust-coloured hair left on his skull and then, humming in her eyes, began carefully to part it. In their former life, this was perhaps a little daily act of no consequence before his breakfast and school. Now she did it like putting flowers on a tiny grave. I'm sure you can see at a glance that this poem is written in free verse. The lines are all different lengths, reflecting the fact that there is no regular rhythm running through the poem, and there's no rhyme scheme either. So no order in that respect. And perhaps this reflects the fact that Achiba is describing a scene of chaos, really. A refugee clearly is somebody who's been uprooted from their home, usually because of the chaos that is war. And that's the predicament that this woman is in as she faces the imminent death of her child. Um, so the lack of order and structure in the poem perhaps reflects the lack of order and structure in this poor woman's life and the lack of structure in anybody's life in this refugee camp. Notice as well the lack of breaks in this poem. It is all one long stanza and perhaps that reflects the fact that there is no pause for breath for this woman as she watches her child die. Um, there's no stopping time as it marches relentlessly towards the horrible moment where she does have to bury him. A cheapest poem isn't so much angry as full of pathos. We're, as readers, supposed to feel great pity for this poor woman as, with immense dignity, she prepares for her child's death by combing his hair and thinking about happier times. So it's a sorrowful poem, um, but a quiet one. And the references to ghosts and the religious imagery that also runs through the poem adds to this atmosphere of quiet sorrow. I mentioned religious imagery earlier and the poem begins with a reference to Madonna and child. In other words, the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus. And we're all familiar with those iconic images of those two. So that comparison lends a significance to this woman's life. There may be tens of thousands of mothers like her, sadly, tragically, watching their children die. But each life matters, and I think this is one of Achieva's points in writing the poem. 
The ellipsis at the end of this opening section suggests a shift in focus and what Chiba does next is pulls away from this focus on mother and child to a panoramic view of the refugee camp in all of its squalor. The description of the refugee camp itself is highly evocative because of Achiba's use of the senses. So we have the odour of diarrhoea and a claustrophobic atmosphere created in the description of the heavy air. On top of that, there are some vivid visual images of the children in their pitiful state. Dried up is a particularly horrible adjective to describe the children. Children are supposed to be fresh and young, not dried up. And similarly, the fact that their steps are laboured emphasises the sheer struggle confronting them. Notice the alliteration of the bus sound. So we have their bottoms behind blown empty bellies. It's a very harsh sound reflecting the harsh reality. And also this list of horrors, unwashed children, washed out ribs, dried up bottoms, blown empty bellies. That listing creates a sense of the profusion, the sheer scale of human suffering in this nightmarish place. But love enables this mother to transcend this squalid environment and to remember a time when she bathed her boy. That image of bathing combined with the washed and washing referred to in the previous section again evokes the Bible and the idea of washing away sins. She has a ghost smile that can be read on two levels at least. The ghost obviously signifies death and we know that her boy is soon to die. But perhaps she, now that she has this refugee status, is a ghost of her former self. Certainly the reference to the past and its contrast with the horrific present adds to the power of the poem and the sense of loss. The pitiful plight of the refugee is reinforced in these lines. She has just a bundle of possessions, including a comb that's broken. Notice the alliteration, bundle, broken, again creating harsh sounds. It's her maternal pride at this point in the poem that compels her to prepare her boy for his death by carrying what hair he's got left. It's described as rust coloured, which connotes decay and dirt, and is also probably a reference to a vitamin deficiency, which turns black hair that colour through malnutrition. Notice as well that the hair is left on not his head, but on his skull, emphasising the idea of thinness. Her tenderness is suggested by the word carefully and by the humming in her eyes, almost as if she's trying to soothe her boy as he approaches the end of his life. A devastating simile concludes the poem when her act of combing the child's hair is compared to that of putting flowers onto his tiny grave. What the poet is saying is that such acts should be every day of no consequence. Things you do without thinking before your child goes off to school. But there's a sense of finality created here because this mother combs his hair very deliberately and carefully, like, in fact, she's arranging flowers on his grave. It's no longer simply a daily act. It's a, an important ritual. And again, we have a reference to religion with the notion of daily act because that connotes the Lord's Prayer. And certainly, Achiba is trying to convey a sense of the deep spirituality of this woman who is in the first line of the poem compared to Madonna. Of 
course, images of refugee camps and starving African children are all too familiar to us in the West. And I think that Achieve has written this poem because he wants us to care by focusing on a particular mother and her dying child, he forces us to acknowledge the humanity of the victims. We cannot help but sympathise with the plight of this one devoted mother and her child. She becomes almost saintly in her devotion, as we've seen. She's compared to Madonna at the start of the poem, and Achiba is underlining the point that these lives matter, this woman matters. Once she had a life and a home and she sent her boy to school. Now, when she combs his hair, it's as if she's putting flowers on his grave and that devastating simile, above all else in the poem perhaps, is designed to shake us out of our complacency. No woman should have to experience this, no mother, especially one who's as tender as Madonna. We don't get inside the head of the mother in this poem. She's observed very much from the outside and we can only assume what tortures she's going through. So the poem is written in the third person by a narrator who's telling a story in the past tense. So we get the impression that this is somebody who's visited the refugee camp and feels compelled to describe the moving scenes that he witnessed there. And certainly it's a moving poem that results. <laughs> 